Good evening. This is our first public event, uh, but we're very, very happy that you're here. I am uh, the director of Conflict and Resolution Studies, a newer program at the college. And I have to thank a legion of people who work together to create events like this. It always teaches me that we are the W&J family. Uh, these people include, and if I forget anyone, I, I'm very sorry, administrators, faculty, the theater staff, faculty member Dan Shaw, and the manager of the house, Arlene Shaw, uh, administrative assistants, the business office, communication and marketing, the dining hall staff, and student workers. There are, there are people in the audience that I must thank too. Conflict and resolution studies owes a great deal to Washington attorney, Carrie Jones, class of 1975, and Washington DC journalist, who is with us tonight, Thomas Squatiri, also class of 75, uh, that class of 1975. That was indeed a vintage year. <laughs> but most years at WMJ are vintage, and certainly I have become vintage. <laughs> That's for sure. Matthew Hodes' introduction the Walter K. Levy Endowed Lecturer. Matthew Hodes has a, had a long and varied career. He has been a soldier, a lawyer, and an international civil servant. Mr. Hodes has served in a variety of positions at the United Nations, at headquarters, and in the field. His field experience included living and working in the former Yugoslavia in the 1900s. He later served as the senior advisor on global conflict for former President Jimmy Carter at the Carter Center. There he worked in Venezuela, Nepal, and Israel-Palestine to promote and develop peace processes. His public service career has focused on mediation, negotiation, facilitation, and third-party interlocutor efforts to advance peace negotiation and mediation processes in conflict and political crisis environments around the world. I have watched him interact with students and faculty for the past three days. Matthew Hodes is a complex thinker and a compassionate man. He is a humble man. Matthew Hodes is the kind of civil servant who would indeed restore everyone's faith in our government. We are going to have him speak now. And we want you, please, we were given cards and pencils when you entered. And would you fill out the cards and pass them uh, to Melissa Cook, who's there, and to Robert, and then we will uh, read the questions uh, from there and get brilliant answers. Matthew. <laughs> it's good to see some familiar masks out in the audience today. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid that's about the end of the laughter for the next few minutes at least. These photos that I've put up may look familiar. However, they are not of places that you're now familiar with. They are not 
uh, about uh, some of the places that you've seen on TV, whether it's Ukraine or Yemen or Ethiopia. The places that are depicted in these photographs are places from 30 years ago. That's Sarajevo. The other photos were of Somalia. I use these photographs because these are the places that I knew best. These are the places that I worked in 30 years ago. Last week was the 30th anniversary of the start of the siege of Sarajevo, which lasted two and a half years, cost thousands of lives. The war in the former Yugoslavia cost 250,000 lives over a period of two and a half years. And a place like Sarajevo, when you look at a map like this, it looks just like a normal map, except for those red lines and those weapon systems that are aligned on ridge lines and hills that surrounded the city. This was what our daily life was when I worked for the UN in Sarajevo in those years. But in 1994, at the end of the year, we attempted to get a ceasefire. And what that required was us driving every day, back and forth, through those lines, over that ridge line down at the bottom of the painting there, and into the Serb secessionist headquarters and go back and forth and back and forth every day. Now this was a city under siege. It had little to no power. The only water was what people would collect under threat of sniper fire from the river. Little to no gas, so no heating. And that's because one side had control. By the end of the process that we engaged in, right on Christmas Eve, we were able to secure a ceasefire. And I mention this because on that night, on Christmas Eve, when we came over the last ridge line, there at the bottom, when I looked into the city, the lights were on. And they hadn't been on for a year. We talk about what kind of meaning our lives can have. And who knows what we can do. But that night, I knew that at least for one night, some people who had not known something as simple as having an electric light on in their home had it. And I had some minor role in helping that happen. That's the level of passion and engagement that comes from the kind of work that I'm going to be describing today. Two years after that, I came back, and I ended up living right where one of those lines used to be. To show you how quickly things change, where I lived would have been exactly where one of those snipers would have been set up to shoot at people. But they weren't there anymore because of what happened with the ceasefire and then a year later with the Dayton Agreement. And so that's how quickly and how dramatically things can change. So the title of my talk is Some Things Change, Some Remain the Same. Go to paraphrase Mark Twain. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often runs. Let's talk about what we'll discuss today. I'm going to be talking about analysis. But more importantly, and where I think the thrust of this conversation needs to be, is one of the things that's changed. The acknowledgement and the recognition of the interconnectivity of a range of issues that impact on today's conflict issues. Then we'll talk about prevention. And then, especially for the students here in the audience, I want to talk about the role of the academy. The role that you all can play, no matter what it is you're majoring in here, in playing a role in that world that I've described. Like Professor Easton said, I've spent the better part of 30 years working on these types of issues in extremely diverse settings, whether it was Venezuela or Nepal, whether it was me sitting with a local warlord or me sitting next to Jimmy Carter. The lessons that one takes away from that 
are lessons that one can apply in a range of different conflict environments going forward. And I want to make sure that we do talk about all of those. But of course, there is an elephant in the room tonight, and that's what you are watching on television every night. The story of what's going on in Ukraine. And I can't ignore it, neither can you. So let's talk about that briefly, and then I'll get on with uh, the rest of what we want to talk about. In the case of Ukraine, we're watching this every day, and we're watching this unfold. And the questions we have to ask ourselves are what are the objectives that the Russians had when they decided to go in? That's got to be playing in our minds all the time, which is our first question about what the academy means. Those of you who are studying psychology are going to be particularly useful in this instance trying to decipher what is going on in the mind of the one man who made the decision to start that war. I don't study psychology, so the best I can do is read a book or ask someone who does. So what are the elements that we can look at and think of as the reasoning behind Putin's actions? What do we know factually about his interests? We know he's obsessed with Russian prestige. We know he sees the use of military force as a means to building that prestige. And he's done it before. So we understand that evidence. That's what he was doing in Syria, trying to ensure that he had a Mediterranean seaport, an air base, the ability to project power. That was part of the objective there. It is part of how he thinks through a problem. And he sees the current borders of Russia as fungible because that gets in the way of the issue of prestige and his memory of going all the way back to Tsarist era, what a Russian empire can and should look like. So his efforts then, if you see them through prisms like that, demand that you start thinking about how do we get it so wrong? Where are the miscalculations? Well, one was he overestimated the competence of his own military. Why is that? Let's think about his experience as president. All of these efforts that he's engaged in since 2004, for example, whether it was Georgia in 2008, whether it was Syria between 2008 and the present, whether it was Crimea and the uh, Donbass region in 2014, even his deployment of special operations people under the guise of a private contractor in places as far away as the Central African Republic all have certain things in common. One, very low risk. Very low risk. He wasn't committing much. Even in Georgia, where it was a conventional invasion, he only went a certain distance with a certain number of troops, and then he stopped. What else did he get wrong? Because now, thinking that his military was that competent based on achieving strategic objectives with minimal uh, use of effort, he thought he could do something similar in Ukraine. But he also miscalculated the capacity of the Ukrainian military. He should have known better. He knew what the United States was doing in terms of training up military resources in Ukraine to include the fact that he's known for years that the U.S. Army Special Forces has a battalion in southern Germany whose job has been for decades to train up people like the Ukrainian resistance had that was, if that had been required. And then his last miscalculation that I can think of was his miscalculation of both NATO, the United States, and the collective West. He never believed that anyone would lift a finger to go and help Ukraine for the same reason that he was looking into his past and he saw that no one lifted a finger to help Georgia and no one had lifted a finger to help Ukraine in 2014. With that in place, let's think about what would have to happen for us to see a change in what's going on in the current environment. This actually leads us to what we're going to talk about regarding conflict analysis. In any conflict setting, if you're looking for the opportunity for a negotiated outcome, 
What are you looking for? You're looking for an actual standing on the battlefield. That's not just perceived, it's actual, that you are seeing that the militaries on either side are not making advances. The second part is that you have to see that the parties have perceived that that actual stalemate is a stalemate. That the parties, through their actions, have concluded that the stalemate can't be broken through an increase in force. And then finally, this is where the analyst uh, problem becomes more acute. You have to be able to identify that the parties themselves, through their actions, are reflecting that they can see an outcome other than total victory. Without those things in place, it's hard to imagine you'll ever have a fruitful negotiation in that conflict. But I tell you that because it's part of the analytical toolbox that any conflict resolution specialist has to have in their brains that creates the filters that you are using when you're looking at any situation on the ground. So with that, let's start talking in more detail about analysis. Well, we got that one. Okay, the first and perhaps most important element that anybody has to do when they're analyzing a conflict is start to think about why a party is going to be interested in using armed force to achieve a goal. What are conflicts about? Well, conflicts are about things. And what do we mean by things? Things are tangible. So when we talk about a conflict about things, we're talking about conflicts over the ownership of something. It can be the ownership of land. It can be the ownership of political power. It can also be the uh, ability, the, the, uh, the, the thing that we're talking about is the power to drive economic benefit. All of these things are things that people will fight on and have. The next area is this idea of conflicts about identity. We're hearing about that more and more, but it's not new. This is when we come back to the idea of history rhyming. That, that conflict in the former Yugoslavia was all about identity politics. Identity politics layered on an issue of power. So when we talk about conflicts about identity, we're thinking about these issues of tribalism and ethnic solidarity that even today in Ukraine we see Putin attempting to try and describe. You know, the, he'll do it through a tool like the use of the Russian language. People in the former Soviet Union spoke Russia from the Baltic states to Georgia and everywhere in between. Didn't mean they were Russian. This is an echo of what Hitler did in the 1930s, talking about uh, trying to take over portions of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland because the people there spoke German, and therefore it was, should be part of Germany. Tom and I saw that in the former Yugoslavia when the Serbs would say that if someone was buried in a particular place who happened to be Serbian by ethnicity, that should be part of Serbia. So these identity issues become strong motivators that can, in fact, create the atmosphere for an armed conflict. Last but not least is the idea that we can have conflicts about ideas. In the post-World War II environment, that was the norm. You were talking about post-colonial struggles that were largely ideologically based uh, along Cold War lines between capitalism and communism. That was the norm. You never see that much anymore. The idea of a conflict about ideas is about ideology, and we are not, this is one of those things that has changed. Ideology represents much less of a concept that we're seeing in modern day conflict than it used to be. I actually was involved in one of the last conflicts that was purely based on Cold War type ideology, the Civil War in Nepal, where for years a royal palace had been able to exist alongside a parliament. But there was also a group of Maoist insurgents 
who were completely dedicated to Red Chinese ideology from the 1970s. They had been a part of electoral politics and then left because they couldn't be radical enough in that environment. But that ideological conflict ended up sort of fading out around 2004, 2006. And the reason for it was the Maoists realized they could get more if they just got rid of the monarchy and came back to regular electoral politics. And what happened in that case was we, at the Carter Center, had been trying to work with all three sides, but the palace simply would not negotiate. And so we ended up being usurped in our role because the Indian government decided to mediate the conflict, and they did it while shutting out the monarchy. Have you heard who the king of Nepal is now? No. You know why? There is no king of Nepal anymore. The Indian broker peace agreement ended the monarchy completely. That's the last of the genuinely traditional ideological conflicts we've seen on the globe since that time. Now the next thing we need to talk about are igniters of conflict. Igniters of conflict are best identified as a singular act that in a scenario that is ripe for conflict sets people over the edge. The classic example that we talk about as the single act that ended up putting a world at war was the assassination of the Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914. For 10 years before that, Germany, France, Russia had all been building up their militaries, had all been playing proxy wars in the colonial spaces that they tried to occupy. But they weren't capable of going after one another. And of course, at this time, we still have the old empires, the Ottoman Empire, which occupied all of the Middle East as we know it today. The Habsburg Empire, the, which was the Austrian throne, that controlled all of what we know of as the Balkans today. In the end, all those pressures were building, and all it took was the assassination of one of the members of the royal houses to set in motion first the Austrian invasion of Serbia, then the Russian declaration they would protect the Serbs, then the French decision to join in with the Russians, then the English decision to join in with them, and then the German decision to help the Austrians. And within a period of time from, I think it was June 28th to August the 4th, that's all it took to go from no war to a global conflict. That's what an igniter does. The last thing we need to talk about in terms of setting up this framework for analysis is understanding the accelerators or the fuel of conflict. Here, we're going to talk about physical science a little bit. The concept of momentum, the concept of inertia. What happens in terms of accelerators or conflict is that once a pattern establishes itself, that the war has started, that now the war is supported, and now that you're going to find other reasons to maintain that setting, that's what will happen. And the clearest example, and the most recent one that some of our some of us will still remember, is the manner in which the U.S. government, over a period of 10 years, continued to justify an expansion uh, of the war in Vietnam and continued to build year after year, whether it was through uh, the deployment of troops or through the refusal to do uh, negotiations or squeezing one form of bombing campaign after another, either over South Vietnam or over North Vietnam or even into Cambodia and Laos. It happened year after year after year, to the point that it was more difficult to stop the war than it was to continue feeding people into the machine and resulting in the 58,000 dead Americans that we ended up with at the end of that conflict. So, those are your frameworks. There's one important parallel I want to try to draw here. If you think about the terminology I'm using, the analogy is to a fire. 
And if you've been out camping, you know that what you have to do when you're building a fire is you have to have the fuel, you have to have the kindling that allows the fuel to burn, and you have to have the spark that lights the kindling. When you have all that and you have a supply of fuel, you can have a fire and just keep it going. Conflicts work the same way. Now, and as I promised Professor Easton, this is where we get into how you all are getting into this field and how what you're studying. No matter what major one of you tells me you're doing today, it will contribute to the kind of work that is necessary to try to move past wars and get to peaceful outcomes. Here's some examples. Climate change is now one of those global issues that if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, would not be on that chart. It's not because people like Professor East didn't know it was going on. It's because people like the rest of us weren't paying attention. Migration. The idea that migration was happening is, again, that's not new. What's new is our recognition of migration as a critical issue and as a potential tension creator that may in fact create both igniters, fuels, and accelerants of conflict. Human rights. Let's talk about just how recent the history is regarding human rights. Professor Easton was talking about our members from the class of 75 who are in the audience today. The first major human rights based organization at a multilateral level was the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, which was designed as a human rights promoting organization during the period of detente between the Soviet Union and the United States. That conference was started in 1975. Before that, there were no dedicated institutions that were looking at it through an official multilateral lens. That's how recent it was. In the context of the United States government, after that, the only time that you started to see it become a key element of American foreign policy was with the Carter administration. And as a lasting legacy, regardless of who was president after that, there is to this day a division within the State Department that's dedicated to the topic. So it's only 40 years that we've been paying attention in the context of trying to work as human rights as a foreign policy issue. Not because it wasn't there, but because we weren't choosing to address it. And then last, terrorism. There are some politicians in this country who still have a conversation suggesting that terrorism is a function of 9-11. That before that, there was no such thing as terrorism. And yet, that's the first mistake anybody could make in talking about terrorism as a topic. Terrorism has gone on since before the turn of the 20th century. Some of you know about the Bolshevik Revolution and the killing of the Tsar Nicholas II by communist revolutionaries. Most people don't remember that Tsar Nicholas became Tsar Nicholas because his father, Tsar Alexander, was blown apart by an anarchist who was engaged in a terrorist activity trying to frighten the Russian royal family. That's how the man ascended to the throne in the first place. Terrorist activities throughout that period were normal. Terrorist activities prior to 9-11 were so normal that in the 1970s, entire elements of US foreign policy and defense policy were adjusted and changed to address that threat. That was a threat in those days that traced back to the uh, national liberation movements of the post-World War II Cold War era, where certain groups who were trying to advocate for nationalist interests did so by trying to draw attention through terrorist acts. We had a sequence of hijackings and bombings of aircraft with civilians on them in some cases that uh, were done by one or another group. Some of us remember the names. It's not just the PLO, although that was the most famous one, but the, the Red Brigades in Italy, 
the Bader Meinhof gang in Germany. The Irish Brooklyn Army was involved in some of this. All of this was part and parcel of the use of a tactic that then at 9-11 we saw in a different manner because it was hitting us directly and at home. So terror's ideology in conflict is nothing new. Anybody who tries to tell you that is misleading you. You need to understand that when you're looking at terrorism as part and parcel of the conflict analysis, that that is a tactic, not an ideology in and of itself. Now, identity and terrorism and conflict becomes very important because we have seen countries try to use forms of terror to advance those types of identity-based ideologies. That's entirely what's going on with Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Those are identity-based groups who are trying to, uh, if not overthrow countries, certainly weaken them so that their version of how they want to see their religion promulgated are the ones that become dominant. And so if you look at that origin story, you start to see how the tactic then becomes used in places like Yemen, which is now based on an identity-based conflict, or Mali, where you have the Tuareg insurgency in the north as opposed to the government in the south. Nigeria, as Bruno well knows, you know, all the way back to the 60s, tribal-based conflicts uh, were in uh, Nigeria, and still do to this day. Or, as we were talking about earlier, Somalia, where clan-based conflicts have now been layered on top of by terrorist organizations to make Somalia nearly ungovernable. I was there in 1993. I was there because in 1992, and we're going to talk about famine later, I was there because the United States government had decided they were going to augment what the United Nations was doing by sending in military troops to try and help feed people who were suffering from the famine. But the famine that they were suffering from was one that was created by men. It was two armed factions fighting over the only arable land in the area. And so people ended up being hungry. You remember those photos that I put up at the beginning. Those starving people in the second photo, they were from Somalia. Those child soldiers, they were from Somalia. So let's talk about power. If there is one through line with all of these conflict drivers, it's going to be difficult to overlook the centrality of the thirst for power. When you have power, you have the ability to dictate the manner in which goods and services and political patronage and food and electricity and water and land are disposed. So wealth is allocated and distributed by those who have the power. The fact of the matter is, where you have someone with total control that's where you have the biggest problems because then the vagaries of the decision making of that one person becomes the entire basis on which all of those issues are managed. This is what we're seeing in Russia today. It goes even to the issue of information. In West Africa, we have the issue now of a, uh, a spate of coup, coup d'etat. Why? because governance is so weak that people who are looking for power see only one way to achieve it. The BBC has reported that the overall number of coups in Africa has been consistent over a 40-year period from 1960 to 2000, at least four per year. This is the scenario of instability that you see when that competition for power is what it is. So in our interconnected world, we have to take a look at how each one of these topics then feeds and serves as either an accelerator or a potential igniter of conflict. The most important one I'll talk about is the issue of climate change and how it uh, reflects itself in conflict in Africa. The fact of the matter is, let me go back to the other slide. The fact of the matter is that there is a chain of events, a cascade, that starts with climate change 
that ends up impacting each of the other topics that we're talking about here. So with climate change comes the following types of issues. You have wild swings in temperatures. Those wild swings in temperatures have an impact on sea, sea, uh, the sea temperature and the level of the seas. Those, in fact, turn around and impact the availability of water. The availability of water, in turn, affects the ability for people to serve as farmers or herders in various communities. All of that then places the availability of land at a premium. And what happens when people compete over land? Some people lose migration. If you lose the fight over water or land, what do you do? You leave. But when you leave, what happens? You come into contact with another population. Maybe that population isn't interested in you competing for their land or their water. And you end up with more conflict. And as a result, the issues of human rights and terrorism that we talk about become increasingly easy to detect. So let's talk about what happens instead. There is an effort increasingly as we look into the world today of people understanding these dynamics. What certainly changed is the ability for people to see that these issues exist and to recognize and acknowledge their existence. And so what we've had in the last 20 years is the development of something called peace building which can run, the risk, or can run the gamut of activities done to prevent conflict before the igniter happens to what happens after a peace agreement is reached and you're looking to make peace sustainable. We've also seen preventive deployments where there's a place that may be at risk but can be pacified through the deployment of forces before a problem arises. We saw that in Macedonia in the 1990s. It's an option that's out there for people to use, and we've seen it used in since then. And then, expanded analytical capacity. The State Department now has a Bureau for Conflict and Stabilization Operations. This is the outgrowth of what happened post 9-11. However, it also includes the fact that the State Department now looks at assessing risks of conflict in places that are not yet in conflict. That wasn't happening before the year 2000. It's happening now. There's something called an interagency conflict assessment framework that was developed before Obama came into office. It was during the Bush 43 administration that attempts to use concepts related to systems theory and the holistic idea of the development of these patterns of behavior to understand which countries are facing the greatest risk based on repeated behaviors inside the country and identify the places which, if interventions happen at an early stage, can result in changes. That's just one tool. The important thing about that tool, though, is that it's not just the State Department, it's not just the Defense Department that's involved, it's not just USAID, it's the Agriculture Department, it's the Commerce Department, it's the Justice Department, that framework allowed for a holistic range of different agencies to apply themselves to developing the analysis. And I say that because that leads to our issues relating to your role and the role of the academy in developing the future agenda, that agenda of preventive diplomacy, that agenda of peace building. There's not a major in this room that doesn't have the ability to contribute to the kind of work we're talking about. If you're a biologist, you'll know more about how those patterns of behavior exist in nature, and you'll know how to apply that logic in a combat environment. If you're an anthropologist, you're going to be able to tell someone like me more about how a society operates how they communicate, how they internally resolve their conflicts. The bottom line is, whether it's the physical sciences, the social sciences, whether it's the arts and the humanities, the roles that are available for people to play in this kind of work are myriad. 
There is no reason why this kind of work is not work that, for those of you who are so interested, you might want to take a look. Because everything you're studying today has a potential application tomorrow. The bottom line about how many things have changed and how many things have stayed the same, we could debate that all night. But the bottom line is that what has stayed the same is that conflicts have a way of starting, they have a way of persisting, they have a way of ending. That hasn't changed. And people still want power. What has changed is our understanding of it. What has changed is our recognition that these global issues exist, that these global issues are important, and that by tackling them, we can help to make a more peaceful world. That change alone is worth the lessons that we've learned to try and get there. So with that, let me finish my uh, prepared remarks and let's talk about what you want to talk about. You've had many different careers. Do you want to talk about the advantages of having changed careers? As uh, Professor Easton pointed out at the beginning, I started out as a soldier, then I was a lawyer, and then I got into the International Civil Service. As distinct as those career paths were, there was another through line that made them all somewhat related, and it was that grounding that I had as an undergraduate in international relations. That's why I'm talking to you about this interconnectivity. It starts with even a major like that was an interdisciplinary major. You know, it was a combination of poli-sci, history, and economics. And so those of you who are studying those fields, you know, you can do anything you want with that kind of information. But the passion that I felt for my work as a soldier when I started trying to practice law just wasn't there. Uh, my last year on active duty, I was at the 82nd Airborne Division of Fort Bragg. So I had, my rucksack was already loaded up at the battalion. My duffel bag was in my closet and we were on, the way we lived was we were on a 30 minute recall for deployment anywhere around the world in 18 hours. When I went back to practicing law, and I found that my excitement came from saving State Farm Insurance Company $5,000, that just didn't add up for me. So what did lawyering teach me? Lawyering gave me a skill set. It gave me an analytical base. But I also required that I get out and use it in a different setting. So the lack of passion that came from that kind of domestic practice drove me to get my postgraduate degree that then led me to the UN. And I never turned back from 1992 until now. So you want to talk about how that progression happened? That's how it happened. And had I not gone to the UN and I'd done those jobs, even, even the legal counsel job, I would never have gotten to the field, and if I had never gotten to the field, I never would have gotten into this work. So these things, one thing does tend to lead to another, even if they're not exactly in a straight line. Do you want to tell how you ended up working for the United Nations? So, at that point where I was really kind of depressed about being in standard public, uh, private practice back in Florida, I reached out to a couple of people I knew. They said, look, you need to get another hook. So I started looking for postgraduate programs that would sort of allow me to transition. And the one that kept coming back was to, since I already had a law degree, was to get a Master of Laws in Public International Law. For other people, that'll be something else. For me, that's what it was. And once I was in, especially in the UK, where an LLM degree is more of a professional degree than an academic one. Uh, I was able to get introduced to a range of rather senior people. I, I was too inexperienced to realize how experienced they were at the time, but they were relatively senior people who kind of shepherded me, shepherded me through the process 
of getting into the Office of Legal Affairs in New York. So that's, that's how that happened. Thank you. Well, I have some good questions for you. <laughs> and uh, I think many of these are from uh, students. Uh, would you like to talk a bit more about the impact of the languages on people, specifically in terms of their power at a time of conflict? There are issues of credibility that come with communication. Effective communication is a form of credibility. And if you cannot effectively communicate, you will not be credible. There's a story that goes around about Stalin in 1941, approximately a month after the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. Stalin never spoke in public because he had this very heavy regional accent in his Russian because he was a native Georgian, and Georgian was his first language. And so it was only at the very edge of disaster that Stalin agreed to go on the radio and speak to the Soviet public. And they knew who he was because of his accent. And so in the end, even with the accent, the willingness to try and communicate was enough to create the credibility. But I'll take that a step further. For those of you who are studying languages, the ability to communicate in the language of the people with whom you're working is essential. I grew up in a community where I had to speak some Spanish, and my Spanish is still pretty good. When we were in Venezuela in the early 2000s, I didn't use an interpreter. People noticed. In Bosnia, during the war, and Tom can uh, attest to this, life was coming at you fast. We were working basically seven days a week, especially inside Sarajevo when I would be down there. And everything was in English because you didn't have time to worry about it. We had one guy who served as our translator, Tom remembers Darko, who uh, ended up becoming a UN political officer years later. But that was during my first tour during the war, because that was a wartime environment and you had no time to play. The only phrases I picked up in Serbo-Croatian had to do with ordering a meal and saying hello to a young woman. That would be it. I went back during the process of the uh, Dayton, after the Dayton Agreement, to rebuild the Bosnian judiciary. While I was there, I hired someone to tutor me in the local language for this specific purpose, not just of better social interaction after work, but because I reached the point where I was opening and closing meetings in the local language without an interpreter, and only brought the interpreter in when it was time for us to talk in detail about specific issues. But the fact that I started these meetings in their language made all the difference in terms of my credibility with the parties. Right. So the, the bottom line for the students, the more language you learn, the better. What advice, <laughs> what advice would you give a student who would like to go into foreign policy? There are, it used to be, when I was in sitting where you're sitting, you would hear one option and one option only. Take the foreign service exam. It's for the other people in the room, not in your head, right? Okay. That's not true anymore. The options available to you if you want to get involved in things that relate to foreign policy now are wide open. Yes, the foreign service remains the first and the most important option to consider if you think that's how you want to spend your life. I get it. But then there are other things. Service with the United Nations, is, it's not that easy for a US national these days, but it's, it's possible. And much like the Foreign Service, there's an exam process for professionals. I got in because I was an older person and I was getting in at a, at a different level. But there's the same kind of process if you want to become a UN political officer, for example, or a humanitarian officer, or a human rights officer. There are ways to get in. 
Third thing I would tell you is that in the difference between where I was when I was where you're sitting and today, is that the options within the non-governmental organizations and the think tanks are way more expansive than when I was where you are. And so your ability to sort of research all of these different options is going to be quite a challenge for you, not because there's not much of a path, but because there are too many paths to just describe in one answer. I, I had a related question for an undergraduate uh, that wanted, you've answered how to become involved with the UN, but what about for students? Are there internships at the UN? Yes. Okay, so the UN internship is really hard to get, is highly competitive, generally requires that you commit a year and find your own way to pay for a rent in New York. Um, so that's a tough one, but yes, it's very valuable. We, we do have Magellans. Sorry? We do have Magellans. Okay. That will help someone with an internship. So it, that's an easy one to access and to identify. My favorite internship program, however, was the Carter Center internship program. I, you know, and I'm biased, so I, I, I'll tell you up front, I'm biased about that one. but. We attracted everything from people who just finished their sophomore year in college to people who were in master's programs and were aiming for PhD programs. And we had a lot of Ivy League types and Johns Hopkins types, but we also had, for example, two of my favorite interns in the conflict resolution program were a young man from a place called Center College in Kentucky. Who knew? He ended up having a range of really good NGO jobs and then started his own business. Another one was a young woman who had finished her bachelor's degree at Georgia Tech and was getting ready to start a master's program there. And she ended up um, getting the master's degree at Georgia Tech, going into the U.S. Army, and then ending up as a civilian DOD official after that. Just to give you a clue as to how some of these people end up, I mean, one, one of my interns is now, the foreign, is now a legislative assistant to a U.S. Senator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Another one is a manager at the World Bank. Another one is um, now in the Policy Planning Bureau at the State Department. I mean, those were the kinds of people that that internship program attracted. And I would guess that that is something that has persisted in the years since I left. Also very uh, competitive, but because it's probably a little less well known in some circles, maybe a little more accessible. Get to the computers, look up the Carter Center <laughs> and the internship programs. The, and Dr. The, Masala will help you. Look, for you guys, you know, because Washington Jefferson is a school of a particular scale, size. You know this, you live it, right? So, whereas the UN is a massive organization with an enormous bureaucracy, there's one woman, well, she's still there, who runs the internship program at the Carter Center. That's it. That's, it's, it, it's, it's a comparable issue of scale for you work, living and working and studying at a small liberal arts college. And now we can depend on you to write recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're getting into uh, some political questions now. Okay. Uh, what lessons were learned uh, from what happened in Serbia or just Yugoslavia in general? Frankly, not good enough lessons. I have these memories of 1995, where we saw fax machines in those days, by the way, and there was the only news was a grainy picture of Sky News, which I guess Sky News, some of you still see it, but then the only 24-hour news channels available were CNN and Sky. And in Sarah you know, all you got was Sky. So there's grainy uh, images coming in from Dayton, and then suddenly our fax machine at the headquarters started cranking, and out started pumping out these documents. And we started reading what was the Dayton Agreement. 
And the first part relating to the separation of forces was really well drafted and well organized and made total sense. And then I got to the rest of it. And it was like, oh, what are we doing? And, you know, what is it, 28 years later? I'm still saying, oh, what are we doing? Bosnia will not be a failed state because the international community won't let that happen. It will never be a fully functioning state, again, because the international community is not committed sufficiently to make that happen. So the lesson, I would argue, that we haven't really seen an opportunity to try it again, although South Sudan was one of the places where we had an opportunity and we, we let it go. Um, Iraq, of course, was another one. We, learned no, we applied no lessons learned from the 1990s in Iraq or Afghanistan, not one. The next opportunity may be Ukraine, but I'll be skeptical to see what kind of lessons get applied from our, our clear failures in the 1990s. In terms of identifying ide ideology, isn't there a danger of selective indignation? Example, in post-1945 U.S. policy was critical of the Dutch trying to reimpose its colonial empire in Indonesia while simultaneously being supportive of France putting down communist insurgency in French Indochina as well as Britain putting down a communist insurgency in Malaysia. How do you deal with this kind of, of these kinds of contradictions? Lesson number one about foreign policy. If you cannot live with uncertainty, double standards, and asymmetries, you're in the wrong world. Get used to it. We had an interesting question from one of the people in Buddhist class the other day about the treatment of the, uh, the U.S. government's treatment of Israel compared to what it does with other, P other countries where there may be more obvious, you know, where there are obvious human rights violations. And there's no good answer for that one other than the strategic interest the United States attaches to one relationship compared to another. You may like it, you may not like it, but in realist terms, and those of you who are studying forms of international relations will understand the concept of realism in foreign policy. The, the issues that you're describing represent realist responses to what were perceived issues for the U.S. government in the post-1945 world. We seem to be fighting misinformation. Uh, in the past years, even from government, uh, we have been flooded with misinformation, uh, and, and how would you deal with an anti-intellectual mood that prevails across the country? Uh, I don't know whether I'm the right person to ask whether how to deal with that, whether there's a story that goes back more than 20 years about the creation of a media ecosystem that has fed a certain type of information towards the public that is highly politicized highly opinionated, and has reached the point where they're not just doing opinion pieces, but they have shifted what they uh, will report as actual fact, and there's an entire portion of the population that follows along with it. We had a conversation uh, in a couple of the classes yesterday and this morning about the importance of people of your generation developing filters of what we call media literacy. Media literacy is all about the fact that unlike us, you know, like fossils like me, when I was a kid, I saw the news on three channels. That was it, three channels. When I was really sharp as an undergrad, and I was one of the smart ones, right? I would read the New York Times, the actual New York Times, because there was no internet, no reading the, reading the damn newspaper. Go to the library, you could also see the Washington Post. You, by contrast, turn on your computer every morning, and you will get a flood of information. 
It was easy for me to figure out what was real and what was fake. How do you do that? You have a much harder challenge in front of you than I ever had when I was your age. And there's an entire movement out there now about developing those skills for you to determine what's real and what's garbage. I'm not even talking about deep fake artificial intelligence issues, which go into a realm that I'll never understand. But you will. People like me, we learn how to use computers. People like you, you have no life experience that didn't include them. So I'm trusting that you all have the ability to develop the skill set of media literacy. Well, these questions may be related. Uh, how do you think that it, uh, what is happening in Ukraine will affect the perception uh, that the international community lacks legitimacy due to recent U.S. isolationism? Well, a lot, in terms of the Americans, a lot will depend on what happens in this next sequence of elections uh, at the midterms coming up in the fall and then the 2024 election. But I think in terms of the international community more broadly, we're already seeing the way that the Europeans are responding in a way that I think has the potential to have long-term uh, impact. We were talking about this earlier today. You, you know, it's one thing for Ursula von der Leyen or Boris Johnson to go walking the streets of Kiev. That's great. But the more important issue was when von der Leyen made a statement in public indicating that uh, the EU membership for Ukraine was weeks away. For Putin, the problem will come when he's dealing not just with an individual state that he considers to be, in his mind, some kind of rogue entity, but when he starts dealing with a member state of the European Union, that's going to change the complexion of how both the diplomacy has to happen as well as the way the international community will react to the sustained support of Ukraine. Because this is not going to go away easily. The Russian way of war is one that may end up being a sustained use of indirect fire without direct engagements on a regular basis that will just create increasing pressure and pain on civilians. 